Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Jeremy Corbyn himself is due to stand up at about 12.15, although they're always a bit late, and we're expecting a speech of up to 60 minutes long. And here to help me set the scene are George Eaton of The New Statesman and Kate McCann of The Daily Telegraph. Welcome to both of you. There's been a lot of excitement and a lot of energy around this Labour conference, perhaps not seen for a number of years for the Labour Party. But Kate McCann, what's actually been achieved at this conference for the leadership? Well, we were just saying, George and I were just saying before we came on air, that it feels very different to the last two years because of course we previously were very focused on leadership contests and whether Jeremy Corbyn was actually still going to be around and this year there has been much more discussion about policy but I still feel like we don't really have a proper direction from Labour so quite a lot of what Jeremy Corbyn is talking about is reactionary so nationalising the railways for example uh, there's a problem and lots of people don't like the way the railways run it's quite a sensible alternative for Labour to be saying on that but I still don't feel like Jeremy Corbyn has a core message to voters particularly voters who are not on the left of the party that he really needs to win in order to get into Downing Street because of course in the last election although Labour did better than expected they still didn't win. And that has been one of the issues, that it's felt like a, a victory conference, if you like. And, of course, Labour performed much better than perhaps they themselves had imagined. But they are still some way off in terms of seats and possibly years off the next election. Absolutely. There's still 64 seats uh, short of a parliamentary majority, and that's not a, a small number. But I think the significant thing now is that... The charge has always been that Jeremy Corbyn isn't interested in power. He just wants to be a protest leader. He's, his priority is to maximise control over the Labour Party, not to win it uh, in, in, the, in the country. And I think the fact he's now talking about being a prime minister and waiting about saying he's ready for power, the, the debate is over the extent to which Labour is ready. But the fact that its aim is, is, is government is, is now clear. And then I think the other significant thing has been the degree of unity. Even if it's an uneasy piece at, at times, Labour is a far more united party than ever seemed possible at the last two conferences. Yes. I mean, there will be people who will say the commentators got it all wrong about when elections are going to be, what might happen, and this idea that they are a government in waiting is perhaps necessary because you don't know what is going to be round the corner. And Kate, do you think they've looked more professional, that there is a slicker operation around the leadership than there has been in past conferences? I think it depends exactly what you look at. So on, on the one hand, um, yes, there, is, there are more policies. So there was a policy on credit cards, the policy on PFI contracts. But then if you look at how that plays out over the next couple of days, we saw, for example, the PFI contract policy from John McDonnell. The next day, John Ashworth, the health secretary, shadow health secretary, goes on the airwaves and says, well, actually, maybe some of those contracts will be kept in-house. And that might sound like a small thing, but actually, if you are a government in waiting, those are really important issues that need to be tied down. And then on the fringes of the conference, we've had another problem, again, which we've seen in previous years, of anti-Semitism. So we've, we've got this issue with protests and people feeling like they're not welcome. And while I think that the party on the left is quite united, I still think, if you look around the conference, there's, there's an absence of so-called moderate MPs. There well, are a lot of people here. who are not here. And and actually that's telling in itself because how can you have a united party when most of them aren't at your conference? You're uniting your, your left-wing supporters and your you know, momentum rally is great and there are lots of young people here, that's wonderful. But the parliamentary Labour Party is not, is for the most part, from this conference. Well, I'm picking up Kate's point about the sort of row, if you like, or argument over PFI, mm. the Private Finance Initiative. You're saying it is important if you're going to be a government in waiting. Or does it matter that much when you're here at conference? Is it, as some of the Shadow Cabinet said, it's about tone, it's about direction of travel, it's what we would like to do, and we're a little bit perhaps shaky on the detail? Yes, well, we can see that uh, Labour's manifesto, its, its overall campaign at the election was not a tra traditional Labour campaign in terms of the amount of detail they necessarily gave on, gave on policy. And John McDonnell made the policy sound more radical in his speech than it actually turned out to be. In a way, it's a reverse of what New Labour used to do, where they take some quite left-wing policies and make them sound more moderate. And he's doing that because he thinks the mood in the country is for radical change and the yeah. idea of making a clean break, not just with the current Conservative government, but actually with British politics since, since Thatcher. Right, well, let's not forget the parties and the letting down of hair. Yeah. I'm sure you have been at all of these do's <laughs> here. And the dancing. Let's take a look.
Well, I couldn't spot either of you two at that particular <laughs> do, but what has it been like in the evenings, in the bars, on the fringe events? It's been a much more ebullient and positive mood than in, in 2016. At times, the debate was, well, will Labour, not just will Labour stay in opposition, but will it exist at all? Or will it be, will it be relegated to, to the fringes of British politics? So I think when a party senses it's, it's advancing, the mood is always, uh, is always much happier. And then I think the fact that you've got so many young people, I mean, this idea that not, not that long ago, people said, look, people don't join political parties anymore. The mood at, at the Corbyn rally on Saturday night, it did feel like I was, I was back at Reading Festival or something. I've never seen a, a mood like that at a political conference. I mean, you don't go anymore. You're not that old, George. <laughs> and just briefly, your highlight of the week. My highlight of the week, uh, the mirror party last night. There was some great karaoke. But what I would say about the parties is there is, again, this split appearing. You've got parties like the mirrors, you know, used to be the big ticket of the night, the, the party everybody wants to get into. And then over the road, you've got the Labour Students' Party, where actually all of the sort of people that George are talking about, all the momentum activists, all the real kind of fired up people there at that party, not at the Mirrors party anymore. And, and actually at that party it was Ed Miliband and the sort of old guard, although John McDonnell did turn up for a little bit. But it, it's, it's different, there's a split, there's certainly a split in, in terms of where we used to all want to be and where most people are now. Well of course I didn't go to any of the parties, I went to bed early, <laughs> obviously getting some shut eye before today. Thank you both very much for joining me here. So Jeremy Corbyn is preparing for his big conference speech, his third as party leader. He's almost an old hand at this now, and in all the briefing we've seen so far, he wants to convey the idea that he is a Prime Minister in waiting. Mr Corbyn will tell the conference that Labour is ready and that he stands on the threshold of power. So has this conference demonstrated that? Well, on Monday, Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell alluded that Labour was scenario planning for potential issues such as a run on the pound and capital flight if Labour took government. Yesterday, Corbyn confirmed that, saying we need to know what we're going to do. Earlier in the week, Mr McDonnell received a standing ovation as he announced an end to private finance initiative contracts, known as PFIs, and pledged to bring existing PFI contracts back in-house. But Labour sources quickly qualified that it would be a review of current PFI contracts rather than a blanket end to them. And Shadow Health Secretary John Ashworth suggested yesterday that only a handful of the PFI contracts were expected to be returned to public ownership. Shadow Housing Minister John Healy has outlined another challenge for Labour in a new report which highlights concerns that it has become a party that represents the London boroughs only. He writes that white working class voters feel Labour has become young, idealist and cosmopolitan. Well, joining me here is the Shadow International Trade Secretary, Barry Gardner. Welcome to The Daily Politics Joe, on this big here. day for Jeremy Corbyn's speech. Do you really think Labour are on the threshold of power, as Jeremy Corbyn says? You only lost an election a few months ago. Look, I, I think that we have to be ready to take over government whenever the next general election comes. That means that we are on a preparedness footing. And I think what you've seen this week is that the party is up for that. It's clear from the manifesto that we had last time that we have the core policies that we now need to build on. And that's the programme that I think people will see is going to answer the needs of the country as we go into whenever the next general election is as we go into it. Right, but you accept obviously you lost that election a few months ago and there's still a big gap in terms of and, seats between you and the Tories. And, and that, that's a huge sadness to me because it means that we can't translate all those policies, policies about housing. I mean, we've seen since then with Grenfell exactly the need in terms of housing in this country and the way in which people are treated with disdain. And, and that's why it's so important that the sort of policies that we've put forward to build, you know, a million new properties within the lifetime of the first Labour government is absolutely vital and that 100,000 properties a year should be genuinely affordable for people. These are the policies that are going to answer the questions that, that actually young people have these days. And do you accept that Labour failed catastrophically over housing too over many, many years before the Tories came in in 2010? N no, I don't accept we failed catastrophically. Um, but well, you certainly, didn't build the number of houses that you were supposed we to. Di we didn't build the number of houses that we could have and should have done. But if you look at what we did with the infrastructure of this country, all, when, when we came into government in 1997, 
50% of all the buildings in the National Health Service were over 100 years old. By 2005, 50% of all the buildings in the health service had been built since 1997. So there was a huge set of rep repairs and, and, and rebuilding to be done. And we did that for our hospitals and for our schools, and it was absolutely essential that right. we did that. And we'll talk about the PFI contracts in just a moment. I mean, are you wargaming these scenarios? Are you involved in these wargaming scenarios um, that could include a flight of capital or a run on the pound if you get into government? Look, speculators attack currencies. That's what they do. That's how they make their money. Because you, they're frightened you, of the policies you, that Labour might introduce. No, no, look, you will, you will remember that the last major attack we had in our currency, well, you and I will remember, 25 years ago, um, it was when George Soros attacked the pound, forced a Tory government out of the exchange rate mechanism, sure. and, and he said that he had borrowed, borrowed sterling that he didn't own to sell it when, and can, then buy it you, back at a cheap you, rate. He made cite, a billion can you pounds cite another that one day. Where a party in opposition wanting to be in government actually expressed its fears that its radical agenda might result no, no, no. in a flight from capital uh, and a run on the pound. Look, I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a, a deliberate and willful misinterpretation of what's going on. What every, what every government and what every responsible opposition should do is to prepare all scenarios to, to make sure that we protect the currency in this. Now, look at what the government failed to do before Brexit. They entirely failed to protect the We're country. We're going to talk about Brexit well, in a minute because no, no, actually, but, I need no, you to is, answer the questions. I am very answering important your question. Because as you say, if there were I, a flight of capital or a run on the pound and you were in government, you we, would be having to deal with and it. I'm so what have you out, war And I'm pointing out to you, Joe, that actually over the past year we have precisely had a depreciation in the pound of 15%. Since, since the Brexit vote, actually the Bank of England had to put 70 billion pounds of quantitative easing into our economy because the government didn't prepare for the, the consequences of the Brexit and so you've vote. Made those preparations. And that's why I'm saying we as a responsible opposition preparing to go into government will get it right. We won't right. allow speculators to attack our currency. Uh, we will be able to defend it if they do. All right, well, let's talk about private finance initiative because the head of the CBI said it was going to drive or send investors into the hills. But first of all, let's establish exactly what the policy is. Um, John McDonnell wants to announce an end to PFIs. Are you on board with that policy? Yes. Look, um, let, let me try and explain the situation here in, in a way that takes it out of the, the realms of grand finance. Um, in Dorset, we have police stations that are standing empty, but the, the, the people there are paying £2 million a year for that police station because it was built under PFI. In, in Bristol, a school is paying £8,000 to have a blind sure. changed. I, and the I, National I, Audit with Office... With all due respect, Ragnar, we have gone over the detail and the substance of this well, policy, important as it is with your colleagues. But what we haven't established... Well, not with you on yet this programme exactly, and not yeah, with your viewers. But yesterday we did... <laughs> yes, with our viewers who've been following uh, the conference. What we're still trying to establish is whether you're actually going to do this important policy as you see it. No. Did you know that this was going to be yes, announced let, ahead of time? Let, let me, let Did me, you? Yes, let me just explain exactly how it operates, because I think that's what you want to understand. No, I, I well, understand that's what how it said. operates, and we have set it Not out quite PFI, clearly. Not the PFI, I'm talking about what we're doing, right. about how we will be taking those PFI contracts back. At the moment, if you look at the National Audit Office and if you look at the Public Accounts Committee's report, what they have said is that investors are making excess profits mm. by selling shares in the, the PFI contracts and, and in the, uh, the vehicles that operate those contracts. Now, what we said we would do is we would buy out, we would do a debt for equity swap for those contracts. And you will definitely and do that with sorry, all PFI contracts. Please, please allow me to finish, OK? And that £189 billion pounds of debt that this country currently has to pay over the lifetime of these contracts will be taken out and what will be stripped out of it is the interest payments, is the dividends that are currently going to shareholders, so it makes it cheaper. In the National Health Service, the PFI contracts at the moment, 31% 
of the, the cost of those contracts are going to pay so dividends to So why did your colleague John Ashworth, the Shadow Health Secretary, actually say it will only probably be a few of these contracts because some of them are working well? There, there, are, a number of, there are a number of PFI contracts um, which have been bought out already because of the failures of them. Right. But what we're saying is there will be no future PFI contracts. I understand. And, and are you going to bring all existing PFI contracts into public ownership? We, we will be looking to bring PFI contracts into public ownership, not sim not simply because the risk transfer that was supposed to go on did not take place, but actually because for the public purse it's the most cost-effective thing to do, as reported by the All National right. Audit Office well, and the Public well, Accounts clear. Committee. So you knew about this policy beforehand. They are going to be taken up into public ownership. It isn't just a review. You've clarified those two points for us, although there has been some confusion around it. Let's turn to Brexit, because Jeremy Corbyn is expected to accuse the government in his speech of self-interested Brexit bungling. Do you think Labour could have done any better? Oh, absolutely. Look, what would you have achieved by now? Well, can, can I just say, we were saying right before all the negotiations started, before the triggering of Article 50, we were saying that the first thing that a Labour government would do is unilaterally give those citizens living, EU, EU citizens living in the UK, the, the rights, all the full rights. And you would have done and that. And that has poisoned, absolutely poisoned, the whole process of these negotiations. Uh, you talk to any of the European officials, you talk to any European parliamentarian, and that's what they will tell right. you, that the fear that is being engendered that European citizens in this country working, paying taxes, bringing up their children in schools here in this country don't know what their future is. All right, well, let's, let's look at something that we don't quite know or we're not clear about on Labour's policy, and that is regarding the single market. Let's just have a look at some of the conflicting messages from the Shadow Cabinet. The damage that would be done to our economy by pulling out of the single market at this time could be substantial. We wouldn't want to leave membership of the single market. Our aim is to have a tariff-free trade access to Europe. I think we should put it in those terms rather than anything else at this stage. I think people will interpret membership of the single market as not respecting that referendum. You want to end up with Sorry. the same benefits, but you're definitely it, it, leaving. It, it, no. What, what we've said is it's an open question. So the Labour position is this, is we leave the European Union, we, as leaving the European Union, it means we need to leave the single market. We want to retain the benefits that we currently have as part of the customs union and the single market. Now, whether that's inside or outside, that's a moot point. To be absolutely crystal clear, we leave the single European market because no, we leave we, the EU. It, the two things are So we have to leave linked. the yes. single market. Yes. What we've said is the transitional period, i.e. from March 2019 until we get to uh, a new and final deal, uh, will be within a customs union and within the single market. It's not a U-turn, it's a development of our policy. We yes. think that uh, being part of the customs union uh, and the single market is important in those transitional times because that's the way you protect jobs and the economy and it might be a permanent outcome of the negotiations. It's a formal process that when you leave the EU, you leave the single market. So you will leave but the single no, market? Yeah, but don't overinterpret that. We want a relationship which allows us to trade within the single market, whether that's formal membership, which is only possible, I believe, if you're actually a member of the EU, or whether it's an agreed trading relationship, is open for discussion. discussion. Barry Garner, do you understand why people are confused by Labour's Brexit policy? Well, look, let, let me try and dispel your confusion, Joe, OK? What we've said is that during the transition period, and we believe there should be a transition period, we said that before Theresa May's Florence speech, she's now come to our position on this, that during the transition period we need certainty and clarity for business, and that means we should stay as things are during that transition. The length of the transition yes. should be, we have said, it should be as long as necessary and as short as possible. But that's meaningless, we, isn't it, Barry no, Gardner? Because that no, means no, it could be ten years or it no, could be no, two. No, let's be clear. We've said that we believe it would be between two to three years, but we are... Annalise Dodds, your colleague, sorry, 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 here and said can, it could be between two well, and five. Well, can I, can I just... If you allow me to say what I, I believe, I'm in the shadow cabinet, OK? And I, I'll, well, I'll, I'll tell you... All right, what, so she was right, wrong, then. Uh, what, what I'm, I've given you the Labour Party's official position, which is that we will have a transition period which keeps things as they are mm. for about, about 
two to three years, we think, but the point is here, we are pragmatic. We understand that business is better to get certainty and clarity about the final deal than it is to rush a deal and not be able to give business that certainty. I understand. Because jobs in this country depend on it. All right. And we are concerned to have a Brexit that is about jobs. In fact, let's get away from talking about Brexit. Let's talk about a new partnership with the European well, Union. Well, let's talk about that which, partnership which gives and the shape us, of it. Because you've said, no, you've been clear about this transition. Good. You've said two to three years. We've heard different things this week, but fine, I'll take your word um, that you would like to see it be two to three years. Let's talk about the customs union, because you said in the past that remaining in a customs union would not be desirable. Yet Keir Starmer, the shadow Brexit secretary, still thinks it's a possible end destination for I, Labour. I, I love the way you leave out the other part of that speech, where I talked about remaining in a customs union like the Turkish do, right, would be not in our best interest. Because actually what you have to understand is that once you leave the European Union, you are out of the customs union. OK, you are not a member of the customs union. And you would obviously if, like to do free trade if, deals if, once Britain well, leaves the EU. You can ask me that different question after I've answered your first question. Okay? We've got a lot of questions to get um, through, but yes, good, go on. Good, that's fine. Um, what we're, what we're saying about the asymmetry that a Turkish deal would have, and that's what I pointed out, that the asymmetry is this. A Turkish deal says that the EU negotiated with Mexico and it negotiated the, the, it negotiated the tariffs and the quotas on behalf of the customs union. Which sectors Tur that Turkey covers um, would you like to cover? Let, let me just mm. answer your question. So that means that Mexico can import its cars mm. into Turkey without tariffs. Right. But Turkey cannot benefit from the deal that has been done with the EU and get its textiles into Mexico without tariffs. Right. So what which I'm sectors saying, would you like so, to see covered? So let's be clear. If we were in that sort of a customs union after we leave the EU, it would mean that the EU could perhaps negotiate a trade deal with the United States, which opened and liberalised our markets to US produce, but did not give us reciprocal rights of access into the US. And is this that would, right? That, I'm, that I'm just would be to a bad what deal. You, right, OK, what, so um, what would be a good deal and which sectors would you like to see covered? We, if we are going to, and, and we have laid all the structures mm. They are left on the table. We're focused on the benefits. The good thing about a customs union is that actually you trade vis-a-vis -vis yourselves on a tariff-free basis. It means that uh, you have to... I understand what a customs union yes, is. Yes, but maybe, you're, you know, I'm sure that maybe not all of your, your viewers sure, do. But they and don't need a history lesson exactly. What we're trying to establish is Labour-specific policy here because there are conflicting but, messages. No, so people not. need to know Absolutely what they're voting not. for here. What because have, you've written in the past... Hang on, you've written in the past remaining a member of the single market would make the UK a vassal state. Well, now it's Labour's policy to remain in it for the duration of up to three years and seek its benefits in the final. Final deal. Sorry, look, um, stop confusing the transition period with the end state, right? What, I, what, what our policy has been, at, and we, we did this before the summer, we have said that we want the benefits that we currently have of, of the single market access, which is about the regulatory controls on services, the standards and the certification of each other's standards. What, what we want is we want the benefits of tariff free access within the European Union that comes from the customs union. But we are not fixated on the structures of delivering that. Right. It would be silly to say that we take, we pluck off the shelf this particular model, like Norway, for example, that's in the EEA, a member of the single market, but not in the European so Union. Why? Because our economy is different from the economy of Norway. Sure. Well, it would be silly. Well, well, hang on, let me just finish and then, then do the example. It would be silly of us to say that we want to pluck off the model of Turkey and the customs union and end up with no reciprocal rights. So, yes, we want those benefits. Let's not get fixated on the structures. Right. If we were in government doing the negotiation, we would be negotiating to achieve all those benefits as much as we can, given what the other side right, will Well, let's take arrange. a live example uh, with Bombardier, for example, one of Northern Ireland's biggest employers. This morning, the US Absolutely. Department has announced a punitive tariff of up to 220%. 200%. 
220 220%. 219%. Well, all right. Importing tariffs on every C series aircraft sold by Bombardier. So, even out of the EU, when you're doing your own free trade deals, it doesn't bode well, does it? It, it is absolutely appalling. Right. And, and not for a it moment, shows the and, not that you for, could run and not for a moment would the World Trade Organization dispute mechanism allow that to stand. And it won't. But what we need to be asking this government is she spoke to Donald Trump. Theresa May went and spoke to Donald Trump about Bombardier. Mm. She was supposed to get assurances about those 4,000 jobs. Would you have got better jobs. assurances from Donald Trump? <laughs> we, we, if we were in government, um, we would be taking Donald Trump now to the dispute mechanism within the WTO and complaining that this is completely illegitimate. And then there and may what be no I free want, trade deal and, for you. No, absolutely not. Look. The, the American way of doing business is a protectionist model, mm. right? Well, and that's they, what I'm saying. So they, that is a problem, isn't it, for free trade deals in the future? Because that's what you're going to be up against. Sorry, what do you mean we're going to be up against? The government's stated position is that they, they are the ones who are saying that they want to leave the largest free trade bloc in the world, the European Union, mm. supposedly in order to go off and do free trade deals with America, with mm. China, with India. And this has thrown up a problem. And, and, and the point is this, that free trade trade deals take time to negotiate because each side mm. wants to protect their own markets whilst getting I access understand. to the other. And that is why so. Theresa May should be brought to account today. She should make a statement about how she is going to address this huge problem for our workforce in Northern Ireland. All right. 4,000 jobs at stake. She said she'd sorted it when she spoke to him. She hasn't. She now needs to take it to the WTO or, and get a ruling on or it. Or are senior figures within your party, most notably Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, uh, who are advocating to stay in the single market, are they right? Uh, in one recent poll, only 4.2% of Labour members said they definitely believe Britain should leave the grouping. Are you out of step with your party? Actually, what they want is to stay in the single market. You, you know, what I think is always most important for a political party is to be in step with the country. And, and the point here is that 48% of our country thought one thing and 52% of our country thought, thought the other. And our job as a political party is not to pander to one side as opposed to the other. Our job is to try and unite the country around something that can go forward in the national interest. That's what Keir and I have been doing over the past few months. And you persuaded we, Jeremy that, Corbyn to do the that's, same. That's why we have put together the mm. policies that we have and that's why I think the British people are now looking at us precisely as a government in waiting because they recognise that unlike the other lot who are fighting like rats in a sack, we we are united and we have a programme that will unite the country. All right. Not on the single market. You weren't completely united at the beginning of the week. But, Barry Gardner, I take your point. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, it's been a pretty tribal affair here in Brighton, as you would expect. There's not been a lot of love expressed for political rivals. But is it OK to have friends in another political party? If you're Labour, now whisper it, a Tory friend perhaps. Over the summer, one Labour MP suggested not. Um, Ellie Price, who is a friend to all, has been out with the move box. But hang on, we're just going to hold on to that film because we can see Jeremy Corbyn. He is arriving here at the conference centre in Brighton. He's being clapped in. There are his fans and supporters, just outside from where we're sitting, in fact. We'll probably hear some noise on the set as he comes through the doors. He's expected to get to the stage at about quarter past 12. It might be near a half past. We can hear the cheers there for him. Um, and he is probably going to speak for about 45 minutes to an hour. He will say to delegates here, after a pretty excitable week for everybody, that Labour is preparing to be in government, that they are on the brink of power. And as he tours through the building, he will no doubt be given a hero's welcome. There has been something of a cult of personality around Jeremy Corbyn this week. Um, but while he makes his way slowly in, having to uh, shake everybody's hand, it seems, it could be a while before he actually gets through the front door, let's go to that mood box that I was talking about, about whether you can have friends in other political parties. Our conference, the highest concentration of Labour supporting people in the same place at the same time. A broad church of chums who pretty much agree on most of the important things. Or do they? What we're asking today is could you ever be friends with a Tory? Yes or no? Thank you for being a friend. I guess I'll have to say yes, especially as my sister was a Surrey County Councillor. 
<laughs> you can't not talk to your sister, can you? If one of my friends decided to tell me that they were a Tory, I'd probably talk to them about it and see if we could come to some understanding. Saying you're not a friend of a Tory is an unneighbourly, um, unlabour thing to do. I think I'd be unlikely to be friends with a Tory because they, I wouldn't have much in common with them. But I don't think it's impossible. But you can't avoid them. They're everywhere. And if you Are you friends with any Tory? Not knowingly. Have you got any friends with Tory? Yeah, loads. Have you kissed one? No, I haven't kissed one. I can't be friends with Tories. My dad won't let me. Could you be friends with a Tory? No! They might be nice people. Well, up to now, I couldn't find any. Okay. <laughs> I am a Tory. Why are you here? That's a simple one, yeah. It's putting no one in for me, no. No, not possible. Yeah. You've not got any friends in the, no, in the Commons? Well, Tom Tongue and Hat, I suppose. Well, they've got a kind of, um, I'd call it a new, neuro deficit on the ethical level. You know, they don't really have empathy. Could you be friends with a Tory? Surprisingly, I found that much easier to do than with the um, whoop, Lib Dems. My mother-in-law was a Tory, and she was lovely. She was just misguided. So. <laughs> Could I be friends with a Tory? Yeah. yeah. I reckon. Any in particular? I've never kissed one, though. Uh, no. I'll be friends with him. My father's a Tory. <laughs> Gosh, you heard it here first. I mean, there's some Tory MPs I feel safer on a desert island with than some of my bunch. <laughs> you know? I'd probably get eaten alive by some of mine. I might survive with some Tories. It was Laura Pidcock who said she couldn't be friends with a Tory, although apparently she meant Tory MPs and going drinking with them. But the majority of this lot here are a friendly bunch, and yeah, they could be friends with a Tory. Ellie Price there. Well, I'm joined now by Times columnist Matthew Paris, who in a former life was a Conservative MP, and by Eleanor Smith, the recently elected Labour MP for Wolverhampton South West. Welcome to both of you. So. Could you be friends with a Tory? I think you could be a working colleague, not necessarily a friend, because um, there are some things that you probably might need the, uh, in, in regards to the cross-party, so I found out recently. But I wouldn't say a friend. i definitely say definitely a working colleague. Why not a friend? Well, a friend says that you have still something in common. <laughs> you don't necessarily have something in common with the Tory party. Even beyond time. politics, I mean, even beyond the party politics, there couldn't be something that it you would have. You see, the reason why they've joined the Tory party is because they don't have anything in common with, with me or anybody else. So. Have you found Conservative MPs welcoming you since you entered the Commons? I've had the odd nod, which is nice. I, no, I didn't. Just a nod? Just a nod <laughs> to acknowledge that, that I'm there. So they there, haven't overstated good. the welcome oh, then? No, absolutely not. No. Right. And what about you, Matthew? I mean, in your day, you know, is it, you know, was it a case that people had close friendships across the political divide? There were some people you could be friends with and some people you really couldn't. I had plenty of friends in the Labour Party. My research assistant now is a card-carrying member of the Labour Party. I don't really have much of a problem as a Conservative with middle-of-the-road Labour people, but people on the far left, I could love them, but I would think they had a screw loose. And they, they might like my company, but they would think I was a greedy capitalist and you know that, that uh, is I that what you think of Matthew sympathy. and do you yeah. think uh, and has got I a screw loose personally <laughs> think that you're a, you know a screen capitalist but your policies the policies that the Tory party um, actually does says that so yes. if you're supporting that to me that would say that but aren't there yeah go on Matthew I was going to say people support parties in all kinds of ways and you you mustn't project onto everybody that says they vote Conservative, all the things you don't like about the Conservative Party any more than I would do that with the Labour Party. But, you know, say it was UKIP, I would have a, a problem with a friend who was UKIP. They could still be my friend, but I would think there was something wrong with their values. So there's no question about that. But there are issues that surely bring people together. Everyone's always talking about let's have a cross-party consensus on social care or international aid. And are those not the things that do draw people from either side 
of the divide together. Which is why I said a working colleague. Why I see, but not to go out for a cosy not, drink with. Well, I'd, I'd have to think twice about that. You, you've come to the wrong place, Joe, <laughs> if you want to find people who, who don't think that politics and friendship yeah, can conflict. No, but I think it's interesting that Laura, your, your colleague, actually said she could never be friends with the Tory in that fairly final way. Did you agree with her? If that's how Laura feels, absolutely, you know, because it's an individual thing and not necessarily everybody. I personally don't think I could, and I, I put the word don't think because one never says never. Right. The truth is, you know, one doesn't want to sound um, too, too slushy, but you, you, you don't choose your friends on the basis of their politics, and you may just find you like somebody, later discover that you disagree with them. It can't stop you liking them, can it? No, well, I wouldn't have thought so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in terms of the paraphernalia that has been around here, some of the merchandising, never kissed a Tory, never would kiss a Tory. I mean, it's fun to some extent, um, but do you think there is a serious message behind that sort of thing? No, I think we should take it how it is. It, it's fun. Um, um, who knows what they're going to say about us at their party conference? I suppose they've got never kissed a Labour or whatever, you know. <laughs> so it, no, but if no. they don't play, in the, well, that's no. fine. No, We're conservatives much more, are more polite. Oh, that's what they call. Is the that British true? Politeness. Whether you can yes. say it that broadly, a generalisation that uh, Tories generally are more polite? Yes, I, I think you'll hear all kinds of language from the Tories about Labour and about socialism, but you won't often hear it translated into dislike. Of, a, of, a, of an individual. Now, Dennis Skinner, veteran Labour MP, gave a rabble-rousing speech here, um, said the idea of going on a holiday with the Tory would be appalling. I don't know why he chose the idea of a holiday. Would you go on holiday with Dennis Skinner? No, no, but from plenty of reasons beyond ideal, <laughs> ideological <laughs> ones, I would have and perhaps we shouldn't. <laughs> perhaps we shouldn't necessarily explore no, that now. No. Have you made lots of friends on the Labour side? Oh, yeah, uh, quite a number of my colleagues, especially particularly the new ones, because you, you tend to formulate with the new ones that come in you feel affiliated to them because the other ones have already made their name so you kind of like feel and I note today that all the new um, MPs that won the, from different parties including Tories and Nib Dem is up there and SNP is up there now and it's fantastic to see that. Well before you go and I'm sure it'll never happen but would you go on holiday with Dennis Skinner? Yeah. Would oh. you? Yeah. Would you? yeah. Where would you go? To. Where would be your ideal uh, holiday destination? I, I think on a beach, definitely on the Greek <laughs> Isles. No, the well, yes, the I tides. hope you have a lovely time. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, not long now until the main event, Jeremy Corbyn's speech. But first, let's take a look back at some of the highlights of Labour's last 12 months. I'm delighted to declare Jeremy Corbyn elected as leader of the Labour Party. Let's wipe that slate clean from today. In harmony. The eyes to the right, 498. The nose to the left, 114. Dozens of Labour MPs voting against, but a thumping government majority. If the Prime Minister can deliver a deal that meets our tests, that will be fine. We'll back her. I have just chaired a meeting of the Cabinet where we agreed that the government should call a general election. Questions to the Prime Minister. Over the last seven years, the Tories have broken every promise on living standards, the deficit, debt, the National Health Service and schools funding. Why should anyone believe a word they say over the next seven weeks? Jeremy Corbyn! Right, we have lift off. Why would the British people want as their leader a man who for years supported the IRA? I didn't support the IRA, I don't support the IRA. What I want everywhere is a peace process. Guess who came after all, and what an entrance. We have to stop thinking, as you do, that there's a magic money tree. Have you been to a food bank? Have you seen people sleeping around our station? Have you seen... Are you saying there are no circumstances Look, under oh, which you'd use it? Any circumstances where anyone's prepared to use a nuclear weapon is disastrous for the whole planet. The Conservatives are the largest party 
Note, they don't have an overall majority at this stage. 266 for Labour. That's up 34. Now, welcome to viewers who join us on the BBC News Channel. And with me to discuss everything that's going to be covered in this speech is the journalist and writer Rachel Shabby. And we will be joined shortly by our political editor, Laura Kunzberg. Well, Jeremy Corbyn, of course, has entered the conference centre. And we will show you some shots from inside the hall as we're talking at the moment. Delegates have gathered. Always difficult to get a seat inside the hall. Rachel Shabby. There has been a level of excitement that's not been seen at a Labour Party conference for a number of years, particularly around the personality of Jeremy Corbyn. But do you think that has reached its peak and it's going to be difficult to sustain if there isn't an election for a number of years? Well, I think you're right that there has been a buoyancy and a vibrancy around a uh, Labour conference this year, which we haven't seen uh, over the last few years. It's become a place where people want to be. Um, and I think that it's not just about Jeremy Corbyn, although of course that is important and his leadership is important, but it is also the political platform that they have brought to the Labour Party, which has revived its fortunes by engaging with people in a really unprecedented way. Um, but you're right to question whether that can be taken forward. And that is, of course, very much what people have been discussing over the the last few days, how can we push this one last nudge into victory so that the Labour Party gets into power? And that path to victory, welcelcoming Laura Kunzberg here to the Daily I'm Politics set. No, I will center. ask you a long question and that will give you time just to get your breath back. Um, some people would say I always ask a long question, so that wouldn't be a problem. Um, but in terms of how they do that, that path to victory, it's not yet clear, is it, how that happens, this one more heave? It's not. And I think also that there are people in the party this week, I've talked to a lot of them this week, who understand it may well not be one more last one more heave. This could be, and we don't know, it might well be five years till another general mm. election. So how do they carry the sort of all that hope, expectation, mm. ambition that a lot of people here this week feel? How do they carry that for five years? Or maybe even for three years or for four years? That is a, a huge ask. And this has been a real phenomenon, something that sort of swept through the Labour movement in the last couple of years. It's only taken two years for things to change so much. Mm. Another two years, goodness knows what happens. And now I think the people at the top of the party are aware of the pressure of expectation. And what was really interesting, a close ally of Jeremy Corbyn said to me yesterday, we're still not quite sure if this is more than a fad. We think it is, we're starting to believe it, but they're not really quite sure yet if this is a sort of permanent structural change to British politics that is really, really digging in. And of course, that's what they're trying to do now. Get roots down, yes. make this permanent. But they can't be sure yet whether they're going to be able to. Because it has centred a lot around going around the country, gathering support, mm. lots of new young members, in some way bypassing the normal established structures of how you might plot a path to victory at the next election. And we've heard of the policy announcements this week, PFI, big nationalisation programme. But if you're going to have to offer something more every year or every few months, how much more radical or transformative can it be? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that, I mean, this is something that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is, is uh, likely to, to mention in his, in his speech today, that they are doing politics very differently. A lot of people don't like that, but they are going to carry on doing politics very differently. And I think one of the things that we're missing about, you know, when we look at the shopping list, the retail politics mm. of Labour's offer, and yes, it has got a lot of things that will alleviate a lot of hardship and pain for a lot of people. It's not just that. There is a symbolic uh, effort there that people are picking up. There's a vision of a different kind of society that society doesn't have to be 
be like this, that something else is possible. And that's what people are picking up on as much as they are the actual retail But is that policies. not just preaching to the converted in some way and perhaps a bit beyond? Um, we've had this report from John Healy, uh, a senior member uh, of Labour, uh, saying that actually if we don't reach beyond that core, some of it sort of young, idealistic and metropolitan, we won't win an election. Here's one interesting concrete thing that we've heard this week, that by Christmas the Labour Party is aiming to have selected nearly 70 parliamentary candidates in current Tory seats and they want them to be in place working on the ground. Strangely, it actually sounds like what the Tories did in pre-2015 and that was contingent on getting money from Lord Ashcroft. The Ashcroft candidates were expected to move house, to move to the constituency and to get dug in several years before the, the next election. Now that is the kind of concrete thing that Labour is starting to try to put in place to reach out to places beyond the preaching preaching to the converted but there's the no question aren't necessarily yeah, and there's that it. tension no question and that tension is also demonstrated inside the shadow cabinet there are people who are you know not sort of true Corbyn believers who sit around that table who want them to sort of want to stop them getting carried away on this sort of surge of enthusiasm and then there are people who say this is a huge moment and therefore they ought to be more radical and that tension exists but just one final thing, there is no question, and it's been so, so striking this week, this is his party now. And for now, in this moment, he can do not whatever he wants, but the feeling here among many of the, the delegates who are so enthused by what's happened, is almost able to follow him to the ends of the earth. And that is something really striking. You sort of feel it in the air. Can't you? Even if the policies aren't exactly what they you know, may feel is going to be good for the economy or good for the country, hence the war gaming. I mean, was it wise to announce, Rachel Shabby, that you were war gaming all sorts of scenarios, including a possibility of a run on the pound or a flight of capital? Well, first of all, I would like to just take issue with this idea of preaching to converted. I mean, 12 million voters are not... Are not you know, it's not preaching to the converted, it's ordinary people, it's people in public life. That's 12 million people we're talking about. And they're not all, you know, the people that have been cast as diehards. And there's no reason for that not to grow. But on the issue of um, wargaming, I mean, I think it's entirely reasonable for a party that is going to put into place some quite transformative policies. Now, they're not transformative, they're not radical by European terms. All they're talking about is, you know, things like raising corporate tax all the way back to the huge levels that the Conservatives had it in uh, 2011. It is wise to say there will be some pushback about that and we need to look at how we will manage that and how we will bring those people on board. Stay with us. I think actually, Laura, you're going to go into the hall. It's full. Um, while Laura goes, thank you very much and we might see you later. The anticipation is building ahead of Jeremy Corbyn's speech and our reporter Ellie Price is outside the conference hall taking the mood. Well, Joe, excitement is rippling through this conference hall. Just in there, very shortly, Jeremy Corbyn will be making his speech. So the 1,200 people who've got in, there were 13,000 people at this conference, I'm told, but not everyone gets in to see the speech. You, sir, didn't get in, did you? But you're still looking forward to it nonetheless. No, I didn't get in, and that's slightly irrelevant, because I think that the people in this country deserve better. We've been led up the garden path in nearly seven years. I feel that the whole of this country is now suffering, and with Brexit, it's going to get a lot worse. Therefore, I hope that the proposals by John McDonnell and by Jeremy Corbyn to radically change this country towards a socialist direction is what I feel I'd like to hear this afternoon, albeit on a big screen up the road. However, I don't care because I'm not irrelevant. I'm just the few. It, it, you don't many. mind. You're not downhearted. No, Marvellous. No. What, what do you want to hear from this speech today? I really just want to see Jeremy Corbyn set his plans for the UK. Um, you know, we really went for a really good manifesto in 2016 and for the many, not the um, not few. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing his proposals and how we can actually take on the Tories and win. And do you think it's been a good conference? Has stuff happened? Has stuff been decided? It's been a great conference. Um, we got through the vote changes that are now essentially mean that the party is now democratised and in the hands of the members, essentially. Um, so it's, it's been a great conference and the atmosphere has been brilliant. One MP told me that actually it's felt more like a victory rally and not really a conference. I mean, are you losing sight of the fact that there's still quite a lot to do? I don't, I don't think that's right. I think this has been an amazing conference. It's my first conference, but from what I've heard, um, this has been one of our most democratic and engaging conferences ever. It's been incredible being on the conference floor and feeling kind of the members having power over this party and controlling the shaping of policy, the direction of strategy. Um, so it's been a fantastic conference and it's, it's, it's a rally of a party getting ready to govern and getting ready to change the world.
and a rally that will end on a speech from Jeremy Corbyn in just a few minutes' time. You don't even mind if you don't get in to see it because, of course, we'll watch it on the big screen. Ellie Price there with delegates and the hall has pretty well filled up. We can only be moments away from Jeremy Corbyn's conference speech and of course he will be talking about how the Labour Party is preparing for government, that it is preparing to take over and set out its policies to the nation at large. With me here is Rachel Shabby who's going to be watching the speech and we'll be talking to her afterwards. She is a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. What has been your highlight this week at the conference, Rachel? I think it's just been really great to see uh, the Labour Party so together and so united and so buoyant. Um, there's been so much energy, whether it's you know in the actual conference hall itself or in the fringe events or at the events organised by Momentum through the World Transform. There is so much energy and dynamism and it's brought so many people into politics. Remember, you know, people were very disengaged and disempowered by our, by our politics for a very long time. And so to see this revival of, of the left, to see the hope and the buoyancy and the energy has been a real delight. But there have been controversies, haven't there? Because, of course, uh, senior Labour MPs, some of them even members of the shadow cabinet, have said that they would have liked to have seen a debate and a binding vote on single market membership yep. um, permanently. There were demonstrations outside from Labour Party members saying that party policy should change to that effect. And, of course, we've had the spectre of anti-Semitism again dogging this conference. Yep. Why? Um, well, look, I think there's two things to say about uh, anti-Semitism, and I've always, uh, as you know, I've spoken about it a lot. Um, I've uh, tried to raise the issue of anti-Semitism on the left and suggested that there is a tone deafness about it. But at the same time, I think the, that there is, it has been disproportionate. The focus on it has been disproportionate. We do have to remember uh, that Ju the Jewish Labour movement did implement uh, a rule change for the Labour Party, and that was uh, supported by Jeremy Corbyn, and it is to be welcomed. It's the move in the right direction. Right, although we spoke to the uh, Jewish Labour movement and they said it is only the start, it is only a move yeah. in the right direction. But as you say, it has been focused on quite a lot this week. We've spoken about the uh, single market and Brexit. Has there been a feeling to you that this has been too much of a victory conference when Labour didn't actually win? Do you think that will be addressed here in the hall in Jeremy Corbyn's speech? Yeah, it's strange. People keep saying that, but I haven't really got a sense of that. What I've got a sense of much more is um, that, that there isn't a sense of complacency, that there is very much a focus on, OK, we didn't win, but we nearly did, and our platform is along the right line, so what do we need to do? How do we need to get, get more people, enough people, so that we do get into power? Um, and I think Jeremy Corbyn will be addressing that in the speech today. Um, he will be saying that the government that the Labour Party is ready to be in government and he is going to say to the government if you cannot get your act together please stand aside because now this is damaging for the country. But that is a slightly strange thing to say because, of course, a government is not going to stand aside, is no. it? <laughs> no, it's not going to stand aside, but, but it is also true that this, this situation is not sustainable. I mean, they manifestly are not able to govern at the moment. Right. I mean, in terms of Brexit, which is the big topic, if you like, of, of politics at the moment, generation, do you think that Labour is going to come unstuck facing both ways, as its critics would say? Attracting leavers on the one hand with the manifesto saying that they would have an end to freedom of movement and on the other saying, well, actually, we do back staying in the single market and the customs union to a transition perhaps up to five years. I think that's probably the best case scenario for Labour while it is in opposition. Its job is to challenge uh, the government's position on Brexit and hold it to account. And it has managed to hold it to account but will with, getting the with getting the transition period into actually government policy. Will it become unravelled? I don't know. But I think at the moment it's a very good holding pattern uh, in the sense that it has persuaded uh, Leave voters that Labour will not go back on the referendum and it has also persuaded Remainers and a lot of the business community as well by the way that a Labour Brexit will be a more responsible one and one that will be not damaging to the economy which is the Labour priority. And the leadership should ignore calls from within the party to consider staying in the single market in perpetuity. I don't think the, I don't think the leadership is in ignoring those calls. Um, they are, I, don't, I don't get the sense that they're being sort of blocked out. This is an ongoing conversation. Nobody is sure what this is going to look like. And I think the Labour position is, this, this is, we will have an end in goal. 
we want a Brexit that guarantees jobs, uh, that guarantees environmental protections, that won't jeopardize the economy because of some random arbitrary figure over immigration that isn't achievable and in fact if it were would be dangerous. Now we've spoken already um, about the fact that you have got to uh, manage expectations if yeah. you like when you are promising quite a big uh, large-scale ambitious plan uh, like John McDonnell for example. Mm. One of the things, one of the dangers do you think for Jeremy Corbyn when saying things like we're going to deal with student debt and then actually not quite being able to back up that rhetoric with policy, that that is a danger going forward. Well, he mentioned that, um, that they would deal with tuition fees and that they would look at student debt. So those are, quite, those are two quite separate yes, things. Scrap tuition fees, but deal with student debt. The implication was that something was going to be done in terms of actually paying it off. Well, I think the implication was that they would look at it um, as opposed to that they actually have a, a, a solution because if they did have, they would have suggested that, put it into the manifesto, which they didn't. Right. I mean, I'm just going to quickly, well, we're not going to go into the hall just yet, but they are showing the video that is always shown about the party leader, Jeremy Corbyn, obviously today, which is about a minute long for all the delegates to warm them up for Jeremy Corbyn's conference speech, which we now expect to be probably in the next minute or so. People are all gathered expectantly waiting for him to take to the stage for a speech that will probably last about 45 minutes. What sort of tone should he strike, do you think, today, Rachel? Well, he wants to obviously uh, consolidate the successes of, uh, of the election and, uh, you know, congratulate everybody for the achievement uh, that was completely unexpected. And, but obviously, as you say, also manage expectation and say the job is not done. We are not yet in government. We want to be. Let's keep going until we get there. And do you think he'll reach out to MPs perhaps who haven't supported him in the past? Ah, oh, I'm going to stop there. Here is Jeremy Corbyn. Rapturous applause there. Senior Labour figures greeting him as he comes in. He has, to some extent, had a hero's welcome from the party, hence the energy around him. He's meeting all the people there, hugging, kissing, shaking hands, glad-handing, with a party. They're chanting, of course, Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. It's been chanted an awful lot this week. We've even had scarves with it emblazoned on the front. Uh, Francis O'Grady there, well, and John Prescott. We had him on earlier in the week. He says people have got to give Jeremy Corbyn a chance and listen to what he has to say. Well, let's do exactly that and listen to Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. Thank you. Thank you. If I could bring conference to order, please. I've always secretly wanted to be conference chair. Conference, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome and this incredible feeling and spirit and unity and love and affection we have here this week in Brighton. Thank you for all of that. Because you know what? It's quite infectious. And let's make sure the whole country's infected with the same thing. 
<laughs> so we meet here this week as a united party advancing in every part of Britain. Winning, winning the confidence of millions of our fellow citizens, setting out our ideas and our plans for our country's future that have already inspired people of all ages and all backgrounds united in this party. And it's a real privilege to be speaking here in Brighton, a city that not only has a long history of hosting Labour conferences, but also of inspirational labour activists. It was over a century ago, here in Brighton, that a teenage shop worker had had enough of the terrible conditions facing her and her workmates. She risked the sack, she risked losing her job, losing everything, to join the shop workers' union. After she'd learn about the existence of the union from a newspaper that had been used to wrap fish and chips. And she was so effective at standing up for women shop workers, she became the Assistant General Secretary of that union before the age of 30. young women paving the way. In that role, she seconded the historic resolution at the Trades Union Congress in 1899 to set up the Labour Representation Committee so that working people would finally have representation in Parliament. The Labour Representation Committee became the Labour Party. And it was this woman Margaret Bondfield, who later became a Labour MP. <clears throat> and in 1929, the first ever woman to join the British Cabinet. From a Brighton drapery to Downing Street, Margaret Bonfield's story is a reminder of the decisive role women have always played in the Labour Party from its foundation, and our party in government will take action to close the gender pay gap. We will introduce mandatory equal pay auditing for large employers and give the Equality and Human Rights Commission the funding it needs to drive through the change. <laughs> Labour has always been about making change by working together and standing up for all. That is what we are in the Labour Party. <clears throat> Conference against all predictions. In June, we won the largest increase in the Labour vote since 1945. <clears throat> and achieved Labour's best vote for a generation. It's a result which has put the Tories on notice and Labour on the threshold of power. Yes, we didn't do quite well enough, and we remain in opposition for now. But we've become a government in waiting. Our outstanding Shadow Cabinet team here today. Thank you for all you do, thank you for the work you do, and thank you for the leadership you give to our party and our movement. Thank you all of you. You can wave, it's okay. <laughs> Great colleagues around the table taking our party and our country forward. And our message to the whole country could not be clearer. Labour is ready. 
ready to tackle inequality, ready to rebuild our national health service, ready to give opportunity, ready to give opportunity to young people, dignity and security to all older people. ready to invest in our economy and meet the challenges of climate change and of automation. <laughs> ready to put peace and justice at the heart of our foreign policy. and ready to build a new and progressive relationship with Europe. We are, we are ready, and the Tories are clearly not. They're certainly not strong, and they're definitely not stable. And they're hanging on by their fingertips. But this Tory government does have one thing we lack. They have tracked down the magic money tree. <laughs> it's been found and it's been put to use. I'm not going to say good use, it's been put to use. It, when it was needed to keep Theresa May in Downing Street, it was given a good old shake. <laughs> and lo and behold, we now know the price of power. It's approximately £100 million for each Democratic Unionist MP. <laughs> during, during the election campaign, Theresa May told voters they faced the threat of a coalition of chaos. Do you remember that? <laughs> well, now they're showing us just exactly how that works. <laughs> I don't just mean the Prime Minister's desperate deal with the DUP. She's got a coalition of chaos all around her cabinet table. <laughs> Philip Hammond and Liam Fox, Boris Johnson and David Davis, at each other's throats, squabbling and plotting, manoeuvring to bundle the PM out of number 10 and take her place at the first opportunity. Instead of getting to grips with the momentous issues facing this country. But this coalition of chaos is no joke. Just look at the record since the Conservatives have been in office the longest fall in people's pay since records began. Homelessness doubled. Look around the streets of Brighton and every other city and you see the effects of it. <laughs> NHS waiting lists lengthening, school class sizes growing and teachers leaving. Over four million children now living in poverty. 20,000 police officers and 11,000 firefighters lost their jobs because of this government. More people in work and in poverty than ever before. And condemned by the United Nations for violating the rights of disabled people. That's not strong and stable. It's callous and it's calculating. Because the Tories calculated that making life worse for millions in the name of austerity would pay for hefty tax handouts for the rich and powerful. Conference, your efforts in the election campaign stopped the Tories in their tracks. The election result has already delivered one Tory U-turn after another. 
over some, only some, of their most damaging policies. The cruel dementia tax was scrapped within three days of it being announced because we challenged it. Plans to bring back grammar schools have been ditched. The threat to the pensions triple lock abandoned. Withdrawal of winter fuel payments dumped. The pledge, such a Tory pledge, to bring back fox hunting was eventually dropped as well. And their plan to end the free school meals that exist in primary schools has been binned. Has been binned. The reality is this, that barely three months since the election, this coalition of conservative chaos is tearing up its manifesto and tearing itself apart. They're bereft of ideas and they're bereft of energy. We've got plenty of energy, I assure you of that. Indeed, they um, seem to be cherry-picking Labour policies instead, including on Brexit. So I say to the Prime Minister, we're very generous, you're welcome. <laughs> but, go the whole hog, end austerity, abolish tuition fees, scrap the public sector pay cap, I think we can find a Commons majority for that. That Commons majority is over there. Thank you. This is a weak and divided government with no purpose beyond clinging to power. It's Labour that's now setting the agenda, winning the arguments for a new common sense about the direction our country should take. My principles come from my mum and dad and the way they brought me up and the principles they gave me. They come from my family, they come from the community I live in and am very proud to represent in Finsbury Park. <laughs> They're my roots and they ground everything that I do. But, conference, there were two stars of our election campaign. The first was our manifesto that drew on the ideas that drew on the ideas of our members and trade unionists and the hopes and the aspirations of communities and workplaces all over the country. And we were clear about how we would pay for it by asking the richest and the largest corporations to start paying their fair share. <laughs> Not simply to redistribute within a system that isn't delivering for most people, but to transform that system so we set out not only how we would protect public services, but how we would rebuild and invest in our economy with a publicly owned engine of sustainable growth, driven by national and regional investment banks to generate good jobs and real prosperity in every region and nation of this country. Our manifesto is the program of a modern, progressive socialist party that's rediscovered its roots and purpose, bucking the trend all across Europe. And conference, the other star of the campaign was you, all of you. Our members, our supporters, and the trade unions, our doorstep and our social media campaigners, young people 
sharing messages and stories on social media, hundreds of thousands organizing online and on the ground to outplay the Tories' big money machine. Is it any wonder that here today in Brighton, you represent the largest political party in Western Europe? <laughs> With nearly 600,000 members alongside 3 million affiliated trade unionists, brimming with enthusiasm and confidence in the potential of all of our people, the real potential that is there. You are the future. And let me say straight away, I'm awed and humbled by everything that you've done, along with hundreds of thousands of others across the country, to take us to where we are today. And I've never been more proud to be your elected leader of this party. <laughs> Our election campaign gave people strength. It brought millions to the electoral register and inspired millions to go to vote for the first time. And Labour was the party of unity, bringing generations and communities together, rather than pitting young and old against each other, which is what the Tories did. We will never seek to squeeze one generation to support another. Under Labour, people win together. <laughs> The result, the result of our campaign confounded every single skeptic and expert. I see John McDonnell said, John McDonnell said at a meeting I was at the other day, he said, the grey beards got it wrong. John, I'm really not sure that is fair. <laughs> We wiped out the Tory majority, winning support in every social and age group, and gaining seats in every region and nation of the country. So, please, Theresa May, take another walking holiday and make another <laughs> impetuous decision. <laughs> The Labour, the Labour campaign machine is primed and ready to roll. <laughs> but, of course, there were some people that didn't come out of the election too well. I'm thinking of some of our more traditional media friends. <laughs> no, come on. We've been kind and gentle here. They, they ran the campaign they always do under orders from their tax exile owners to trash Labour at every turn. <clears throat> the day before the election, I remember it well, I was on trains all day long doing six rallies. One paper devoted 14 pages to attacking the Labour Party. And the following day, our vote went up nearly 10%. <laughs> Never have so many trees died in vain. The British people saw right through it. So this is a message to the Daily Mail's editor. No. Next, oh, no, 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 no. Next time, please make it 28 pages. <laughs> But 
But there's a serious message too. The campaign by the Tories and their loyal media was nasty and personal and it fueled abuse online. And no one was the target of that more than Diane Abbott. Happy birthday to you. Very good, you stole my line. <laughs> Diane has a decades long record of campaigning for social justice, and she's suffered intolerable misogynist and racist abuse. Faced with such an overwhelmingly hostile press and an army of media and social trolls, it's even more important that we stand together. Yes, there will be... Yes, there will be times when we disagree, but there can never, ever be any excuse for any abuse of anybody, by anybody, we are not having it, not tolerating it, not accepting it, and not allowing it. Thank you. Thank you for that, because it's very clear. We settle our differences with democratic votes and then unite around those decisions and go forward. That is the Labour Party here this week and out in communities every week. Diverse, welcoming, democratic and ready to serve our country. There's no bigger test in politics right now than Brexit, an incredibly important and complex process that cannot be reduced to repeating fairy stories from the side of a bus or waiting 15 months to state the obvious. <laughs> As democratic socialists, we accept and respect the referendum result, but respect for a democratic decision does not mean giving a green light to recklessness. Tory. Tory Brexit agenda that would plunge Britain into a Trump-style race to the bottom in rights and corporate taxes. We're not going to be passive spectators to a hopelessly inept negotiating team putting at risk people's jobs, rights and living standards. A team more interested in posturing for personal advantage than in getting the best deal for the country. To be fair, Theresa May's speech in Florence last week did unite the cabinet for a few hours until her plane touched down at Heathrow <laughs> before the divisions broke out again. Never was the national interest so ill-served on such a vital issue.
If there was no other reason for the Tories to go, their self-interested Brexit bungling would be reason enough. So I have a simple message to the Cabinet. For Britain's sake, pull yourself together or make way. One thing needs to be made clear straight away. Three million European Union citizens currently living and working in Britain are welcome here. They have been left under a cloud of insecurity by this government when their future could have been settled months ago. So, Theresa May, please, if you're watching, and I'm sure you are, <laughs> give them the full guarantees they deserve today. Because if you don't, we will when we're in government. Since the referendum results, our Brexit team has focused, above all, on our economic future. That future is now under real threat. A powerful faction in the Conservative leadership sees Brexit as their chance to create a tax haven on the shores of Europe. A low-wage, low-tax, deregulated playground for hedge funds and speculators. A few at the top would do very, very nicely out of this, no question at all. But manufacturing industries would go to the wall, taking skilled jobs with them, our tax base would crumble, our public services would be slashed still further. We're now less than 18 months away from leaving the European Union. And so far, the Tory trio leading the talks have got nowhere and agreed next to nothing. This ragtag cabinet spends more time negotiating with each other than they do with the European Union. A cliff-edge cliff Brexit is at risk of becoming a reality. That's why Labour has made clear that Britain should stay within the basic terms of the Single Market and Customs Union for a limited transition period. It, it is welcome at least that Theresa May has belatedly accepted that. But beyond that transition, our task is a different one. It's to unite everyone in our country around a progressive vision of what Britain could be, but with a government that stands for the many, not the few. <laughs> Labour is the only party that can bring together those who voted Leave and those who backed Remain and unite the country for a future beyond Brexit. <laughs> what matters in the negotiations is to achieve a settlement that delivers jobs, rights and decent living standards. Conference, the real divide could not be clearer. A shambolic Tory Brexit driving down standards or ours that puts jobs first and works for the many, one that guarantees unimpeded access to the single market, establishes a new cooperative relationship with Europe, a Brexit that uses powers returned from Brussels to support a new industrial strategy, to upgrade our economy in every region and nation, one that puts our economy first, not fake immigration targets that fan the flames of fear we will never follow the Tories into the gutter of blaming migrants for the ills of our society. It, 
It isn't migrants who drive down wages and conditions, but the worst bosses in collusion with a Conservative government. They never miss a chance to attack trade unions and weaken people's rights at work. Labour will take action to stop employers driving down pay and conditions, not pander to scapegoating or racism. <laughs> this whole issue is too important to be left to the Conservatives and their internal battles and their identity crises. Labour will hold the government's squabbling ministers to account every step of the way. And with our team, Keir Starmer, Emily Thornbury, and Barry Gardner, thank you, <laughs> Keir, Emily, and Barry, for all you do. As you can say, they're literally standing ready to take over when this government <laughs> fails. When they fail to negotiate a new relationship with Europe that works for all, to help create a Europe for the many, for the future. That is our mission. The truth is that under the Tories, Britain's future is at risk, whatever the outcome of this. Our economy no longer delivers secure housing, secure, well-paid jobs, or rising living standards. There is a new common sense emerging about how the country should be run. That's what we fought for in the election. And that's what's needed to replace the broken model forged by Margaret Thatcher many years ago. <laughs> and 10 years after the global financial crash, the Tories still believe in the same dogmatic mantra deregulate, privatise, cut taxes for the wealthy, weaken rights at work, delivering profits for a few, and debt for the many. Nothing has changed. It's as if we're stuck in a political and economic time war. The Financial Times put it last month that our financial system still looks a lot like the pre-crisis one. And this isn't from the Financial Times, this other bit. The capitalist system still faces a crisis of legitimacy stemming from the crash. Now is the time that government took a more active role in restructuring our economy. <laughs> now is the time that corporate boardrooms were held accountable for their actions now is the time that we developed a new model of economic management to replace the failed dogmas of neoliberalism. That is why Labour, that is why Labour is looking not just to repair the damage done by austerity, but to transform our economy with a new and dynamic role for the public sector, particularly where the private sector has so evidently failed. Take, take the water industry. Of the nine companies in England, six are now owned by private equity or foreign sovereign wealth funds. Their profits are handed out in dividends to shareholders while the infrastructure crumbles. Their companies pay little or nothing in tax and executive pay has soared as the service deteriorates. That's why we are committed to take back our utilities into public ownership.
to put them at the service of our people and our economy and stop the public being ripped off. Of course, there is much more that needs to be done. Our National Investment Bank and the Transformation Fund will be harnessed to mobilize public investment to create wealth and good jobs. And when I've met business groups, I've been very frank with them, we will invest in the education and skills of the workforce. And we will invest in better infrastructure, from energy to digital. But we are going to ask big business to pay a bit more tax. The Tory approach to the economy, the, the Tory approach to the economy isn't entrepreneurial, it's extractive. They've not focused on long-term investment and wealth creation. When you look at what they do rather than what they say, it's all about driving down wages, services and standards to make as much money as quickly as possible. With government, their government not as the servant of the people, but of global corporations. And their disregard for rampant inequality and hollowing out of our public services. The disdain for the powerless and the poor have made our society more brutal and less caring. Now that degraded regime has a tragic monument the chilling wreckage of Grenfell Tower, a horrifying fire in which dozens perished, an entirely avoidable human disaster. One which is an indictment, not just of decades of failed housing policies and privatization, and the yawning inequality in one of the wealthiest boroughs and cities in the world, it's also a damning indictment of a whole outlook which values council tax refunds for the wealthy above decent provision for all and which has contempt for working class communities. Before the fire, a tenants group of Grenfell residents had warned and I quote the words that should haunt all politicians. I quote, the Grenfell Action Group firmly believes that only a catastrophic event will expose the ineptitude and incompetence of our landlord. Grenfell is not just the result of bad political decisions. It stands for a failed and broken system, which Labour must and will replace. The, the poet Ben Ockrey recently wrote in his poem, Grenfell Tower, those who were living now are dead. Those who were breathing are from the earth fled. If you want to see how the poor die, come to see Grenfell Tower. See the tower and let a world-changing dream flower. Thank you, Ben, for that wonderful poem. We have a duty as a country to learn the lessons from this calamity and ensure that a changed world flowers. I hope the public inquiry will assist. But a decent home is a right for everyone, whatever their income or whatever their background. And houses, houses should be homes for the many, not speculative investments for a few. Look, look at the conservative housing record and you understand why Grenfell residents are skeptical about their Conservative Council and this Conservative government. Since 2010, homelessness has doubled. 120,000 children don't have a home to call their own. Home ownership has fallen. 
Thousands are living in homes that are unfit for human habitation. That's why, along with our Shadow Housing Minister, John Healy, and I thank John for his work, we're launching... <laughs> ..a review of social housing policy. It's planning, building, regulation and management. We will listen to tenants across the country and propose a radical program of action and bring it back to next year's conference. But some things are already very clear. Tenants are not being listened to. We will insist that every home is fit for human habitation, a proposal this Tory government voted down in Parliament. And we will control rents when the younger generation's housing costs are three times more than those of their grandparents. That is not sustainable. Rent controls exist in many cities across the world, and I want our cities to have those powers too, and tenants to have those protections. We also need to tax undeveloped land held by developers. Yeah. And have the power to compulsory purchase as Ed Miliband said, use it or lose it. <laughs> families, families need homes. After Grenfell, we must think again about what are called regeneration schemes. Regeneration is a much abused word. Too often, what it really means is forced gentrification and social cleansing. As private developers, as private developers move in and tenants and leaseholders are moved out. We are very clear. We will stop the cuts to Social Security. But we need to go further, as conference decided yesterday. So when councils come forward with proposals for regeneration, we will put down two markers based on one simple principle. Regeneration under a Labour government will be for the benefit of the local people, not private developers, not property speculators. <laughs> First, first, people who live on an estate that's redeveloped must get a home on the same site and the same terms as before. No, no social cleansing, no jacking up of rents, no exorbitant ground rents. And secondly, councils will have to win a ballot of existing tenants and leaseholders before any redevelopment can take place. Real generation, real regeneration, yes, but for the many, not the few. <laughs> That's not all that has to change. As parties unite in paying tribute to our public sector workers, the firefighters who ran into Grenfell Tower to save lives, as Matt told us at conference yesterday. <laughs> the health service workers caring for the maimed in the Manchester terrorist outrage. Those brave police officers who confronted the attackers at London Bridge. And PC, and PC Keith Palmer, who many of us knew, who gave his life when terrorists attacked our democracy. Our public servants make a difference every day between a decent and a threadbare, threadbare society. Everyone praises them. Everyone praises them, but it's Labour that values them and is prepared. <laughs> and 
and, and is prepared to give them the pay rise they deserve and protect the services they provide. Year after year, year after year, the Tories have cut budgets and squeezed public sector pay while cutting taxes for the highest earners, earners and the biggest corporations. You can't care for the nation's health when doctors and nurses are being asked to accept falling living standards year after year. You can't educate our children properly in ever larger class sizes with more teachers than ever leaving the profession. You can't protect the public on the cheap. The police and security services must get the resources they need, not 20,000 jobs lost through police cuts. <laughs> scrapping, scrapping the public sector pay squeeze isn't an act of charity. It is necessary to keep our public services fully staffed and strong. That is the Labour commitment. Not everything worthwhile costs money, though. Like many people, I've been deeply moved by the Daily Mirror's campaign to change the organ donation law. There are more than 5,000 people on organ transplant waiting lists, but a shortage of donors means that in recent years, only 3,500 of them get life-saving treatments they need. So that everybody whose life could be saved by an organ transplant can have the gift of life from one human being to another. The law has already been changed in Wales under the excellent leadership of Carwin Jones and the Welsh Labour government. Thank you, Carwin, and thank you, Welsh Labour, for that and many other things. And today, I make the commitment a Labour government will do the same for England. In the, in the last couple of days, John McDonnell and Rebecca Long-Bailey have set out how we're going to develop the economic plans in our manifesto to ensure that sustainable growth and jobs reach all parts of our country. Thank you, John, and thank you, Becky, for all that you do. And the basis... The basis of their work is that no community or region is held back. So we will establish regional development banks to invest in an industrial strategy for every region. Every region of this country and every nation. But the challenges of the future go beyond the needs to turn our backs on an economic model that has failed to invest and upgrade our economy. We need urgently to face the challenge of automation. Robotics that could make so much of contemporary work redundant. That is a threat in the hands of the greedy, but it's a huge opportunity if managed in the interests of society as a whole. <laughs> Tom Watson spoke extensively about this yesterday, and he and others in the Shadow Cabinet are working hard on this. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, the Shadow Cabinet, for that. We won't re reap the full rewards of these great technological advances if they're monopolised to pile up profits for a few. But if they're publicly managed to share the benefits, they can be the gateway for a new settlement between work and leisure, a springboard for expanded creativity and culture, the tide of automation and technological change means retraining and management of the workforce, and it must be centre stage in the coming years. So Labour will build an education and training system from the cradle to the grave that empowers people, not one that shackles them with death. That's why we will establish a national education service, which will include, at its core, 
free tuition for all college courses, technical and vocational training. So that no one is held back by costs and everyone has the chance to learn. That will give millions a fair chance. Lifelong learning for all is essential in the economy of the future. The huge shift of employment that will take place under the impact of automation must be planned and managed. It demands the reskilling of millions of people. Only Labour understands and will deliver that. As uh, Angela Rayner said yesterday, and thank you, Angela, for all the work that you do and the way you present things. Our National Education Service will be run on clear principles, universal, free and empowering. That conference is central to our socialism for the 21st century. For the many, not the few. <laughs> During the election, I visited Derwentside College in the constituency of our wonderful new MP, Laura Pidcock one of dozens of great new MPs, breathing life and energy into our Parliament. That college offers adult courses in everything from IT to beauty therapy, from engineering to childcare. I met apprentice construction workers. They stand to benefit from Labour's 250 billion National Transformation Fund building the homes people need and the new transport, energy and digital infrastructure our country needs. By changing our economy to make it work for the whole country can't take place in isolation from changing how our country is run. For people to take control of their own lives, our democracy needs to break out from Westminster into all parts of our society and economy where power is unaccountable. All around the world, democracy is facing twin threats. One, from the emergence of authoritarian nationalism that is intolerant and belligerent. The second is apparently more benign, but actually equally insidious. It's that big decisions Big decisions should be left to the elite, that political choices can only be marginal, and that people are consumers first and only citizens a very distant second. <laughs> Democracy has to mean much more than that. It must mean listening to people outside of election time, not just the rich and powerful who are used to calling the shots, but to those at the sharp end who really know what is going on. I'll give you an example. The Greater Manchester police officer who warned Theresa May two years ago that cuts to neighbourhood policing were risking people's lives and security. His concerns were dismissed as crying wolf. Like the care workers sacked when they blow the whistle on the abuse of the elderly. Or teachers intimidated when they speak out about the lack of funding in our children's schools. <laughs> or the doctors who are ignored when they warn that the NHS is crumbling before our eyes or blow the whistle on patient safety. We, Labour, are fighting for a society not only where rewards are more fairly spread, but where people are listened to more as well by government, local council and their employers. Some of the most shocking cases of people not being listened to must surely be the recent revelations of widespread child sex abuse. Yes. Young people, and most often young working class women, have been subjected to the most repugnant abuse. The response lies in making sure that everybody's voice must be heard, no matter who they are 
or what their background. The kind of democracy <laughs> that we should be the kind of democracy that we should be aiming for is one where people have a continuing say in how society is run, how their workplace is run, how the local schools or hospitals are run. That means increasing public accountability and democratisation of local services. Andrew Gwynn was talking about that on Monday. Thank you, Andrew, for the work you do on that. It means democratically accountable public ownership for the natural monopolies with new participatory forms of management, as Rebecca Long Bailey was setting out in her speech yesterday. It means employees, given their voice at work, with unions able to represent them freely, freed of undemocratic fetters on their right to organise. I promised you two years ago that we would do politics differently. And I have to say, it's not always been easy. <laughs> There's quite a few who prefer politics the old way. But let me say, let me say it again, we will do politics differently. And the vital word here is we. Not, not just leaders saying things are different, but everyone having the chance to shape our democracy, our rights as citizens, as important as our rights as consumers. Power devolves the community, not monopolised in Westminster and Whitehall. But let's take it a stage further. Make public services accountable to communities, business accountable to the public, and politicians truly accountable to those we serve. Let the next Labour government transform Britain by genuinely putting power in the hands of the people. The creative, compassionate, committed people of this country. Both at home and abroad, what underpins our politics is our compassion and our solidarity with people including those now recovering from hurricane damage in the Caribbean. I sent a message to a family in Dominica last night. 80% of the island is destroyed. They don't know what to do. They need help and support. Damage all over the Caribbean. Floods in South Asia and Texas. And the horror of the two earthquakes in Mexico and the loss of life as a result of that. Our interdependence as a planet could not be more obvious. <clears throat> the environmental crisis in particular demands a common global response. That's why President Trump's threats to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Treaty are so alarming. There is no contradiction between meeting our climate change commitments and investing to build a strong economy based on high skills industries. In fact, the opposite is the case. Action on climate change is a powerful spur to investment in the green industries and jobs of the future, so long as it's managed as part of a sustainable transition. We know, tragically, that terrorism also recognises no boundaries. We've had five shocking examples in Britain this year alone, two during the course of the general election, and one in my own constituency. Both Andy Burnham and Sadiq Khan, the mayors of Manchester and London, played a crucial role in bringing people together in the aftermath of those brutal attacks. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for Sadiq for what you did.
what you did in uniting communities, the targeting of our democracy, of teenage girls at a music concert, of people enjoying a night out, worshippers outside a mosque, commuters going to work. All these are horrific crimes. And we all unite in both condemning the perpetrators and in our support for the emergency and security services working to keep us safe. All of our communities came together in Manchester and in London to condemn those attacks from all walks of life and all faiths. But we also know that terrorism is thriving in a world that, frankly, our governments have helped to shape with its failed states, military interventions and occupations. <laughs> where millions where millions of people are forced to flee conflict or hunger. We have to do better and swap the knee-jerk response of another bombing campaign for long-term help to solve the conflict rather than fuel them. And we must put and we must put our values at the heart of our foreign policy. Democracy and human rights are not an optional extra to be deployed selectively. So we cannot be silent at the cruel Saudi war in Yemen while continuing to supply arms to Saudi Arabia. or the crushing of democracy in Egypt or Bahrain, or, or the tragic loss of life in the Congo, which the media very seldom bother to report. And I say this today to Aung San Suu Kyi, a champion of democracy and human rights. Please, do all you can to end the violence now against the Rohingya in Myanmar. <laughs> and allow the United Nations and international aid, aid, aid agencies into Rakhine State. The Rohingya have suffered for too long. We should stand firm for peaceful solutions to international crises. Let's tone down the rhetoric and back dialogue and negotiations to wind down the deeply dangerous confrontation over the Korean Peninsula. And I appeal to the United Nations General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, to use the authority of his office to go to Washington and to go to Pyongyang to kickstart that essential process of dialogue. <laughs> and let's give real support to end the oppression of the Palestinian people. The 50-year occupation and illegal settlement expansion and move to a genuine two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Britain's voice needs to be heard independently in the world.
and we must be a candid friend of the United States now more than ever. <laughs> the values we share are not served by building walls. <laughs> Banning immigrants on the basis of religion, polluting the planet, or pandering to racism. <laughs> and let me say frankly, conference, the speech made by the United States President to the UN last week was disturbing. It threatened war and talked of tearing up international agreements. Devoid of con concern for human rights and universal values, it really wasn't a speech that should have been made. Our government, our government has a responsibility. It cannot meekly go along with this dangerous course. If the special relationship means anything, it must mean that we can say to Washington, that way is the wrong way. And that's clearly what's needed in the case of Bombardier, where thousands of jobs are now at stake. Thousands of jobs at risk. A prime minister betting our economic future on a deregulated trade deal with the US might want to take a moment to explain how 220% tariffs are going to boost our exports from this country. So, let Britain's voice be heard loud and clear for peace, for justice and cooperation. <laughs> Conference, it's often said that elections can only be won from the centre ground. And, all right, in a way, that's not wrong, so long as it's clear that the political center of gravity isn't fixed or unmovable. <laughs> Nor is it where the establishment pundits like to think it is, because they know everything, as you know. It shifts as people's expectations and experiences changed and political space is opened up. Today's centre ground is certainly not where it was 20 or 30 years ago. A new consensus is emerging from the great economic crash and the years of austerity to when people started to find a political voice for their hopes for something different and something better. Two thousand and seventeen may be the year when politics finally caught up with the crash of two thousand and eight. Because we offered people a clear choice. We need to build a still broader consensus around the priorities we set in the election campaign. Making the case for both compassion and collective aspiration. That's the real center of gravity in politics. We are now the political mainstream. Yes. <laughs> our manifesto and our policies are popular because that is what most people in the country actually want, not what they're being told they should want. And that's why Labour is on the way back in Scotland, becoming once again the champion of social justice. Thank you, Kezia, for your leadership in Scotland. Thank you, Alex, for taking over. And whoever next leads Scottish Labour, I'll be working with them, delivering a unifying socialist message that will continue to inspire both South 
and north of the border. We saw that in the election campaign. We saw that in our summer campaign. We're going to be out there doing a lot of campaigning. That's why our party now has around twice the membership of all other political parties put together. <laughs> Conference, we have, left, we have left the status quo behind, but we must make the change we seek credible and effective. I hope we've left our own divisions behind, but we must make our unity practical. We know we are campaign ready. We must be government ready too. Our aspirations matched by our competence. During the election campaign, I met and listened to people in every, in every part of the country, and I did the same over the summer. Impressed with the determination of so many people to try to make their communities better. Impressed with the hard work that people put in to try to deliver struggling public services. And I met struggling single parents, young people held back by the lack of opportunity, pensioners anxious about health and social care, public servants trying to keep services together, low and middle earners, self-employed and employed, facing insecurity and squeezed living standards. But hopeful, hopeful, that things could change and that Labour could make a difference. Many hadn't voted before or not for many years past, but they put their faith in our party. We offered an antidote to apathy and despair, to misery and depression. Let everyone understand this. We've come this journey not to let you down because we listen to you, because we believe in you. Labour can and Labour will deliver a Britain for the many, not the few. Well, that was the end of Jeremy Corbyn's conference speech. It was a long speech, well over an hour, an hour and a quarter. He wasn't even allowed to start for a good few minutes as they cheered him to the rafters, as they are doing now. And here we have the usual standing ovation for him, which I guess will go on for several minutes. He's alone there, up on the stage, waving, pointing to all the delegates. He feels and looks quite pumped up. Um, it was a good delivery by Jeremy Corbyn. It had a bit more oomph and energy to it, and he kept it going as he covered a wide range of topics. I mean, everything was in there. In some ways, it could have been just a little bit shorter. There was a clear narrative all the way through that Labour is on the threshold of power. The Tories are on notice, he said. We didn't win, but we are becoming a government in waiting. Here they are cheering him. There's scarves being held up. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. He said Labour is ready, ready to tackle inequality. There was, of course, the classic passage of bashing the Tories and the Tory government, saying they are not strong and definitely not stable. He said they had found the magic money tree uh, in terms of the billion pounds for the Democratic Unionist Party. He then gave his analysis of Britain today. A break, he said, was needed with the Tory mantra of capitalism. He said it was a broken model. But he said the election result, although they didn't win, did put a break on some of the Tories' most damaging policies. They are chanting, of course, Jeremy Corbyn now, and everybody will no doubt be cheering for quite some time. We can hear it behind us here on set in Brighton. He set out and repeated some of the policies that were in his manifesto, and then he had a go at the media, uh, particularly the Daily Mail, saying their negative coverage of him, 14 pages or so during one day in the campaign, actually pushed support up. He said, make it 28 pages next time. But it did lead on to a serious passage about online abuse. He said that was partly the media's fault. He didn't quite say that perhaps some of the supporters of his Labour Party could be responsible too. But he said no one had felt abuse more than Diane Abbott, his shadow Home Secretary. And there was a big cheer for her, and she stood up 
um, and soaked up, if you like, some of the love in the hall for her. And she has, along with many others, suffered that online abuse. We're probably going to hear the anthem now of the Labour Party, the red flag being sung as usual um, at this point. Um, he didn't tackle the issue of anti-Semitism, though, head on, which people might have expected. Um, he then moved on to Brexit. He thanked his team and he said that the Tory government was all over the place and the EU citizens here would always be welcome here. There wasn't that much detail on the economy or how the plans would be paid for. It was much more mood music being repeated, but he said the capitalist system since the crash faced a crisis. There was a long passage on Grenfell Tower, which he said stood as a tragic testament to a less caring society, and he made a couple of announcements on housing before moving on to the international stage. Um, Rachel Shabby, journalist and author, is with me now. Your thoughts, first of all? Well, first of all, uh, he looked much more confident and competent. It was a forceful speech. Um, he was very much in command and in control of that room. The speech had a theme of showing that the Labour Party is ready for government. He did, as you say, spend some time pointing out that this government is not capable, it's not competent, um, they're at each other's throats, they're squabbling, um, they're callous and calculating, and he urged them to either get it together or step aside. Um, and then the rest of the speech was very much drawing together the themes uh, that this Labour leadership attacking left on a left manifesto has been shifting towards the, the for the many, for the few themes, the idea that the economy does not have to work like this, that there is a different way of doing things, uh, that we can have a different way of managing the economy and society for the better. Without setting out, of course, any detailed costings. Now, of course, he will have referred to the manifesto where there were costs set out, but it did seem like there was something for everyone. Um, there were baubles on every branch of every tree and people will say, is it credible? Is it affordable? Can people really pay for it? All he said in passing was, we're just going to tax business a little bit more. And we already know the Institute of Fiscal Studies says that's just not going to do it. Yes, but people will always say, is it credible and is it possible? Because we've been living within an economic paradigm that has for 30 years said to us, this is the only acceptable way and there isn't another acceptable way. By the way, the rest of Europe is looking at us saying, why are you doing it that way? There clearly are other ways to manage an economy and that is what Labour is now trying to align itself with, that there is a different way of managing the economy that will rely on, yes, taxation at the top end, but also investment, borrowing, national investment bank, regional investment bank, restructuring of the economy in a fundamental way. It is very different, which is why people are, keep asking if it's possible. We're not used to thinking that way, but we do need to start thinking that way. All right, well, they're singing Jerusalem in the hall now. Everybody still on their feet with the uh, slogan of course of this conference of Jeremy Corbyn for the many and not the few. Um, housing, that followed on from the passage on Grenfell mm. Tower and there were some announcements um, and policy announcements around that. Tell us about those. Yeah, housing has always been a key issue for Jeremy Corbyn in several interviews. He said that that's top of the list. He wants to see uh, rent controls in our cities much like the ones that exist in other cities around the world. He also raised the issue of keeping uh, accountability uh, for local councils that are looking to uh, restructure council housing, that the people who actually live in those homes will have more of a say and more of a stake in what happens to those homes. Right, and that of course is if they want to, as you say, uh, have a new redevelopment scheme and he right. quoted back Grenfell Tower and some of the residents mm -hmm. uh, groups that had warned about a catastrophe going to happen. Um, in terms of his international world affairs, the passage that he did there, I mean he listed um, obviously some of the things he feels very strongly about, whether it was about Donald Trump or trying to get talks on the Korean Peninsula or the Saudi war in Yemen and a Palestinian state. Interestingly, there was no condemnation of the Venezuelan government, mm. of uh, Maduro, who has been criticised for uh, violent clampdown on protesters. Why not? Well, 
Uh, as you say, there has been a focus on lots of other things. I don't know why Venezuela wasn't raised, but I do know that what, what this policy has done is put a lot of water uh, between uh, the former sort of Labour position and the new one. It has definitely changed its approach. It does not want to be tacked to the US. Uh, he mentioned several times that Britain should have its own voice, an independent voice on the international stage, and that it will sometimes be very different uh, from the the US, especially a US under the leadership of Donald Trump. Now it was interesting at the very end of his speech that he referred to the centre ground, the centre ground of politics that every politician says they want to occupy and he says you know people don't always know exactly where that is, obviously trying to say that the move to the left could perhaps become the centre ground. Um, He's going to find it difficult to persuade people of that, isn't he? I'm not sure he will, you know. I mean, for some time, I think that the centre ground hasn't been where centrists think it is. Most of the population do define themselves as centrists, but they also do support uh, reinvestment in, um, in the welfare state, uh, renationalisation of public services, uh, renationalisation of energy and utility companies, uh, higher taxation, uh, you know, and cracking down on tax avoiders. Now, those are left-wing policies, but they do have majority support. Right, let's just get a little flavour of what delegates who've come out of the hall are thinking. Ellie Price is with some of them. Thank you, Joe. Yes, it was 75 minutes, as you say, so quite a lot to digest there. What did you make of the speech? Um, I was um, very inspired. Uh, I felt that the future was going to be extremely bright for everybody. Um, I, ju I just... I mean, I have co I've come to Brighton. I've seen so many homeless people. Uh, unbelievable. Um, that announcement on housing, obviously. And everything, everything that he spoke about, housing, um, education, the health service inspired me. I know the future is going to be bright under Labour, particularly under Jeremy Corbyn. Excellent. So you're a party member. Now, do you think the message would resonate though beyond the party faithful before the beyond the 1200 people sitting well, in that, that hall? Obviously as Jeremy Corbyn's challenge is you know we're 60 odd seats short of a majority of one. Um, what is there in that speech that's going to take us over that line in the next election? We know next week the Conservatives will be hammering us on where's the money going to come from. So uh, there was a really important word he said in his speech was about being competent. And I think that's the mission now for Labour is to show we're not just a radical alternative or a campaigning force, which we are, but also a competent government that people can trust. And if he can do that, then he will be the next Prime Minister. And was there anything in that speech that really surprised you with what he said? I think there's a, there's a kind of the point about the, the consensus being changed and the centre ground being changed um, is a very interesting piece of analysis. I, I haven't seen evidence for that yet. Uh, we didn't win the last election, um, so maybe that's something that he's teasing out a bit more. Um, but no, I mean, it was a good vintage bit of uh, Corbyn speak. I, my first time I saw him speak was 1988, so I've listened to him quite a few times, and this was a, a vintage performance. Although you would think that actually he's, uh, you know, something rather new. You're a councillor uh, in, in an area that hasn't had a Labour MP for quite some time. Was there anything that, you know, you felt particularly enthused about? I, I think the message there, both local, national and international, was really powerful. I think the comment around competence is key. We need to take those messages back. But ultimately, Jeremy's speech summed up the whole week. It's hope. People will want hope over hate, hope over fear. And we've seen that all week in Jeremy's speech, over an hour long, every word inspirational. Over an hour long, but as you say, the, the, the main feeling here is one of hope and people are leaving with a bit of a spring in their step. Ellie, thank you. Well, joining me now is Labour's election campaign coordinator and the Shadow Community Secretary, Andrew Gwynne. Welcome to The Daily Politics. We only have a few minutes left. The delegates are beginning to pour out of the conference hall. Let's go through some of the policy yes. announcements. We touched on it just a moment ago. He announced that the Labour Party will introduce rent controls. Yes. How will that work? Well, of course, the detail is going to be put together by John Healy. He's going to produce a green paper. But we are absolutely adamant that we fix this housing crisis because we have a housing market that does not not work in the interests and of how ordinary rent people. Fix that well, of course, market. rent can. Rent controls work in cities all over the world. Uh, it's not beyond the wit of man and woman in the United Kingdom to come up with a system that will work for the benefit of people who live in particularly expensive cities like London and like Manchester, uh, where they're being priced out of living in their own home communities. Right, but of course you haven't been able to quite give me the evidence that it would actually help people bring down rents, because the Labour manifesto promised
Christmas to limit rent increases to inflation. Does this go further than that? Well, I think it does. And as I say, we're going to put all the details in a green paper. But of course, it's going to limit rents because the free market has allowed rents to soar. So, of course, if you bring in regulation, you can control rents so that we get a fairer distribution of, uh, of that for the people who need it. Is